Imagine it's your birthday party. All the popular kids have shown up, but they're pissed at you. That's what this moment feels like. You're used to being the most physically formidable person in the room, but in this room, everyone's larger than life, especially the basketball players who tower over you by at least a foot. They're all here for the same reason, to get you to change your mind. The meeting room at the Union Hall in Cleveland, Ohio is unremarkable. Throngs of disgruntled workers have passed through these doors, and it shows. Worn wooden chairs, yellowing walls, no windows. Feels almost like you're back in school. But the people, now they're remarkable. A few you've met before, some you've just seen on TV and in the newspapers. Most had to get on airplanes to be here today. Better them than you. You're not scared of much, but flying terrifies you. You make your way around the room, shaking hands, making small talk. Are you nervous? Yeah, but you can't let it show. That would be off-brand, so you make a joke as you take your seat. So, gentlemen, what a coincidence that all of you just happened to be in Cleveland today. <laughs> they laugh, not just to be polite, because you've got away with a funny line. That, too, is part of your brand. Soon the discussion turns to why everyone's really here, the recent public stand you've taken against the U.S. government, and how it affects not just your future livelihood, but potentially theirs as well. See, there's an elephant in the room. A historic media deal that's in the works, and you're the big draw. If you don't change your position, this new revenue stream could go bye-bye for everybody. So yeah, no pressure. Isn't there some kind of compromise you can make? One of the men want to know. Give them something without having to go all in. I mean, lots of other people have done it. I'm just thinking of you here. You take a deep breath, look into his eyes, and smile. You don't really know any of these people, and yet this sensation is so familiar. All your life, people have wanted, no, they've expected certain things from you. Certain behaviors, certain attitudes, a certain tone. And you don't like it. No matter who's flown in on a jet plane to set you straight. Even if they're right. If you take the deal, everyone will move ahead, but you'll feel like you've compromised your beliefs. If you don't take the deal, your career will crumble to dust and you might end up in jail. He asks again. So what do you want to do? Everyone wants to know. Even you. The room falls silent and waits. From Wondery, I'm Robbie Damon, and this is Imagined Life. On each episode, we'll take you on an immersive journey into the life of someone you may think you know, maybe even admire or the opposite. But no one realizes what it felt like to be them before the whole world knew their name. You will experience the challenges, the heartbreaks, the loss, and the triumph. There will be clues to your identity along the way. Only at the end will you find out who you are. So sit back, let go, and imagine your life. Just a quick note before we get started, this episode has one scene of violence that might not be suitable for all listeners. On this episode, The Warrior. The Kennedy assassination, the civil rights movement, the sexual revolution, the war in Vietnam. Feels like the world is going crazy these days. But right now, you don't care about any of that. You're shopping for a new Cadillac. You love Cadillacs. The sleek fins, the muscle of the grill. It's the kind of car that tells people you arrived, that you're somebody. When you were a kid, you used to press your face to the showroom window and dream of owning one of your own, tomato red with white leather interior. A convertible, of course, so everyone can see it's you. When I'm grown and rich, I'm gonna get me a Cadillac. You're eight years old. You sit at the dinner table with your parents and your little brother, Rudy. Your family's lower middle class, your mom cleans houses, your dad paints signs. He's driven the same car since you were born, so he's not amused by your Cadillac obsession. You're not gonna have any Cadillacs, son. 
Why not, Dad? Why can't I be a millionaire? Your dad taps the top of your hand to indicate the dark brown shade of your skin. That's why you can't be a millionaire. Guess I showed him. You think as you drive your sweet new caddy off the lot. As you cruise down the streets of your hometown, people smile and gasp like you're the second coming of Jesus Christ. You live for this stuff. Some famous folks can't stand being recognized and fawned over all the time. You can't get enough. You put on one of your favorite songs. Sam Cooke's You Send Me on the record player. That's right, your Cadillac has a record player. You know deep down that there are more important things in life than high-tech gadgets and fancy cars, but damn, it sure feels good right now. You felt that same rush over a decade ago when you got your first new set of wheels. Funny enough, it was that set of wheels that got you here in the first place. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. It's mine. You're 12, and your parents have just given you a new bike for Christmas. A tricked out red and white Schwinn with white wall tires, chrome trim, and a light on the front that looks like a rocket ship. You know it costs your parents a lot, and money is tight, so you're waiting for the catch. Merry Christmas, honey, but you gotta share it with your brother. There it is. A few days later, you're pedaling around with Rudy on your handlebars. Your friend Johnny's alongside on his beat-up road bike. Suddenly, you're caught in a downpour. Rudy squints his eyes and pulls down his hood. I can't see anything. What do you need to see? I'm driving. I'm with Rudy. There's a trade show thing at the Columbia Auditorium. Let's go. They got free hot dogs and popcorn. That's all you need to hear. The three of you pull into the lot, park your bikes, and head inside. When you emerge a few hours later, you discover that your new bike is gone. And no one around seems to care. Sir, sir. Did you see anyone here riding off on a red bike? Sorry, son. I just got here. Tears start to flow down your face. If anyone accuses you of being a crybaby, you'll just say it's the rain. Finally, one man tries to help. Go talk to Joe Martin in the rec center over there. He's a cop. Turns out Joe isn't just a cop, he's also a coach. And when you first see him, he's putting a group of athletes through their paces. Young men like you, most a little older, grunting, sweating, trying and failing and getting up and trying again. You find the whole scene intoxicating. You almost forget the reason you came here in the first place. I could do this, you think. You desperately yearn for somewhere to shine. And you know school's not that place. You can barely fit in a desk chair, for starters. No wonder it's so hard for you to sit still for hours on end. The worst, though, is the reading. Even when you try your hardest, the letters look all mixed up. But this, you think, I could do this. I might even be good at it. I could be good at something. You never do find your bike, but you leave with something better. Your ticket to everything. You become obsessed and focus on little else for the rest of the time you're in school. Girls? What girls? Parties? Not until they're being thrown for you. You train like a maniac. Instead of riding the bus to school, you race it, cheered on by your classmates inside. You don't tell Joe Martin, but you start training with another coach on the side, one you believe knows more about technique than Joe. Your day looks like this. Get up, race the bus to school. Get through the day as best you can. Try not to let on. You're not understanding what everyone else seems to get. Pray that the teacher doesn't call on you. If she does, try to make a joke so the other kids laugh. Wait for that damn bell to ring. Ah, freedom. Then you go straight to your part-time job at a Catholic school. Then you train with Joe from 6 to 8. Then you go to the other gym and train from 8 to midnight. Then home, go to bed, and get up and do it all again. You do that for years. 
12 years later, as you drive down your hometown street in your new Cadillac, you smile and think, good thing some chump stole my bike. When you arrive home, there's a camera crew on your lawn. What's going on, fellas? Slow news day. Did you see the paper? No. What's it say? The draft board changed your classification. What? Looks like you're headed overseas. How is this possible? You registered at 18 like every other guy your age. You passed the physical fitness test, no sweat. The mental aptitude test, well, there was sweat. You've struggled with reading and spelling your whole life, so you weren't surprised when you scored in the 16th percentile on the mental test, although you were embarrassed when your score was made public. But you were off the hook because the military didn't accept anyone under the 30th percentile. But now, with the body count rising and Uncle Sam needing more soldiers to fight, they've lowered the score. Your heart starts to race as you read through the article. It feels personal. Like the powers that be think you're getting too big for your britches and need to be brought down to size. Mind if we get your reaction on camera? You never met a camera you didn't like. So you say yes and then speak your mind. What I don't understand is why me? I pay the salary of at least 50,000 men in Vietnam in taxes. Suddenly they want to put me in the army? You never took the test again? No. For two years, the army told everybody that I'm an idiot and I was ashamed. Now they say I'm a genius and I can go in the army. And two men on the local draft board made the decision. Two men. Do you think you're being singled out? You shrug as if to say, you tell me. But your eyes tell a different story. It's not like it hasn't happened before. You're 18, and you've just returned home from the Olympics where you won the gold medal. The endless hours of training, the aching muscles, no social life, it's all paid off. It feels even better than you thought it would. Your hometown gives you a hero's welcome with parades, parties, media appearances. Your parents even paint the front steps of your house red, white, and blue. You're so proud that you wear your medal everywhere even to bed. You're driving down the main drag with your pal Ronnie, who you've known your whole life. You punch him playfully in the arm. Did I tell you they called me the mayor of Olympic Village because I was so friendly and popular? You could be the mayor here too. I don't know, man. There it was different. No one cared that I was black. No one cared that my family wasn't rich or that I couldn't read so good. I got to be my own man, Ronnie. You turn into the parking lot of a downtown restaurant. It's filled with a long row of Harleys, some with the Confederate flag painted on the tanks. Not here, man. Not here. That'll be fine. Remember, I'm practically the mayor now. You both take seats at the counter and order hamburgers and vanilla milkshakes. The waitress heads to the kitchen and returns a minute later with a nervous look on her face. We can't serve you here. You've been hearing that line all your life. The first time was when you were five and your mom took you into a dime store for a drink of water. Instead, a burly security guard escorted you both to the door. You cried the whole way home. But this time's going to be different. You pull the gold medal out from under your jacket and lay it back down on your chest. Ronnie smooths down the ribbons. He's as proud of that thing as you are. The waitress's eyes get wide and she skitters back to the kitchen. A few seconds later, you hear a man's voice bellow. I done told you, we don't serve their kind here. Your heart starts to pound so loudly you think it's going to burst out of your chest and land on the counter. 30 seconds ago, this place was a packed, bustling diner. Now you can hear a pin drop. For years, this moment will pop into your head every time you go to a new restaurant. At random times, too. At a press conference, before sleep. You'll run through all the retorts you wish you had said, always ending with, you should be ashamed. But today, the words won't come out. And you're the one that leaves feeling ashamed. As you and Ronnie ride home in silence, you promise yourself to never roll over like that again.
Since then, you've gotten a lot better at standing up and speaking your mind. And sometimes, you won't shut up. When reporters ask you about the war, you always give them an earful. You tell them you have no quarrel with the Viet Cong. They eat it up. You apply for conscientious objector status. Tell Uncle Sam to fight in a war is against your religion. A religion you converted to a few years back that encourages people to find power within themselves. Your objection is heartfelt and true. It's also true you don't believe in flying 10,000 miles to drop bombs on brown people in Vietnam when black people in the U.S. are treated like second-class citizens. You tell the reporters that, too. The government rejects your request. They say your objections are racial and political and have nothing to do with religion, and they use what you said in the press to justify their decision. Now the clock starts ticking. Your induction ceremony is set two weeks from today. And then they'll ship you off to basic training where it will be screaming drill sergeants, followed by a long plane ride to the jungle with no guarantee you'll be coming back. Unless you listen to that voice inside, the one that promised you would never roll over again. It's time to be your own man before it's too late. You're 25 years old. Finding time to get a fresh, nutritious meal on the table is so often an exercise in futility. Now, if you're like me, you've tried a few meal kit services and found, to your disappointment, that they require way too much preparation. But now, I found Gobble, a meal prep service that takes care of the peeling, the chopping, the marinating, and creating tasty sauces, which saves me time. Having Gobble's army of sous chefs doing all that prep work for me means I can cook fresh, delicious meals with Gobble in 15 minutes, in just one pan. Really. Now, I recently just made their vegetarian dish, and honestly, I was on the fence because I do like a little protein at dinner time. but I gotta say, after it was all said and done and I had it, I didn't miss my chicken or steak or fish. I loved the vegetarian meal. It was absolutely delicious. My fiance loved it and it was so easy to make. I thought it was a perfect dinner and something outside of my comfort zone that I might not usually have. Gobble has a huge variety of delicious meals and it'll bring everyone to the table. Family favorites, gluten or dairy free or vegetarian. And they're offering listeners of Imagined Life a fantastic limited time deal. $50 off your first box. Just go to gobble.com slash imagine to get $50 off. One more time, that's gobble.com slash imagine. Have you heard the buzz about the gift that's on everyone's list this year? It's something they'll use twice a day, every day, and it was featured on Oprah's O list. Have you guessed yet? This it gift is Quip, an electric toothbrush designed to make brushing better. Quip is sleek and efficient with sonic vibrations that are gentle enough, even on sensitive gums and a built-in timer with guiding pulses to remind you when to switch sides. Quip is the gift that keeps on refreshing, with brush heads automatically delivered on a dentist-recommended schedule every three months for just $5. Now, I already had one, but they sent me a second one, and I love it. Now, this one's my new travel Quip. I have one at home, and I've always been an electric toothbrush guy, but this is above and beyond. I love its style and simplicity, and I can already think of a few people I might be gifting it to this holiday season. Quip has over 5,000 verified five-star reviews, and it looks like a big-ticket tech gift with a stocking stuffer price, starting at just $25. If you go to getquip.com slash imagined right now, you get your first refill pack for free with a Quip electric toothbrush. That's your first refill pack free at getquip.com slash imagined. On April 28, 1967, you show up at the Military Induction Center in Houston, Texas. You make your way past a swarm of reporters. Once inside, you take a seat with the 25 other young men who were set to be inducted today. They've all brought suitcases or duffel bags, knowing that as soon as they sign on the dotted line, they're headed straight to basic training. You brought your lawyer. You try to lighten the mood a bit. You all look dejected. Something happening here today? <laughs> a few laugh. You've come to believe that lifting people up is part of your purpose. It makes you feel good, too. So you tell a few more jokes, share a few stories, sign a few autographs. One of the guys asks, You ever get tired of writing your name over and over? 
When you first sat down, he was so nervous, his teeth were chattering. Nice to see he's calmed down a little. I don't mind at all. Are you afraid to go over there? Guess I am. The Viet Cong don't scare me. If they don't get me, two guys from Georgia will. I'd have to watch for the Viet Cong and the guys behind me, too. You laugh, and suddenly your new friend is laughing, too. Gentlemen, attention, please. I'll need you eight men to quietly move into the next room and line up in two rows of four. The room is windowless with faded white walls. An army lieutenant stands at a lectern holding a stack of cards. When your name is called, along with the branch of service you're being assigned to, you will take one step forward. Such a step will constitute your induction into the armed forces. Jeffrey Smith, Marines. Samuel Craig. Your heart starts to pound. You wonder how many of them will come back alive, how many of them will lose limbs, need wheelchairs, be haunted forever by what they'll see. And it's your turn. The lieutenant says your name and your designated branch, the army. You don't move. He calls your name again. Again, you don't move. He looks around with a scowl on his face and sternly tries once more, and you still don't move. You could keep this up all day. You're not going to take that step. You understand that if you refuse to be inducted, you're committing a felony, punishable for up to five years in prison and a $10,000 fine. I understand. Write this on the paper. I refuse to be inducted into the armed forces of the United States. You do it. Now sign it. You sign it. You never turn down an autograph request. News travels fast. By the end of the day, the guys in charge of your sport suspend you from competing and strip you of your awards. All your hard work, everything you accomplished, erased. Like none of it ever happened. It gets worse from there. You go to trial and the jury finds you guilty of draft evasion. The judge hands down the maximum sentence, a $10,000 fine and five years in prison. You get out on bail pending appeal. Your lawyer suspects that the Justice Department pushed the judge to give you the stiffest sentence possible to send a message. They want all the squeaky wheels, especially the black ones, to know that they shouldn't get any bright ideas about rejecting the draft. But your team can't prove it, so what difference does it make? If you ever want to compete again and get back everything they've taken from you, your lawyer will need to take this through the courts. But right now, you'd settle for just staying out of jail. You're instantly adopted by the anti-war movement as one of their own. You never set out to be an activist. You just wanted to be able to pursue your profession, practice your faith, and occasionally buy a sexy new car. But there's something awakening inside you. And you start to realize this is a whole lot bigger than you. A few days after your induction refusal, you're invited to Los Angeles to take part in a peace demonstration in front of a posh hotel where President Johnson is attending a $500 a plate fundraising dinner. You pull up in a Rolls Royce because that's just how you roll. But once you get out, you're just one of the crowd. And when you climb up on top of a garbage can to speak, you try to emphasize the peace part of you being there and minimize the protest part. I'm not a leader. I'm not here to advise you, but I do encourage you to express yourself. Anything designed for peace and to stop the killing of people, I'm 1,000% for. When you climb down from the garbage can, a baby-faced protester asks you to sign his draft card. You do. Then another asks, and another, and another. Two weeks later, you're forced to surrender your passport to the same judge who gave you the maximum sentence. Why? Because you took part in an anti-war demonstration while out on bail. He seems particularly offended that you autographed draft cards. Clearly, the government needs your punishment to hurt. And it does. Every time you pick up a newspaper or turn on the television, someone's coming down on you. One columnist calls you the greatest American patriot since Benedict Arnold. That's one of the nicer ones. People on the street call you names like traitor and draft dodger and worse. 
One day you're flying home to Chicago and the plane hits a patch of bad turbulence. It's already your worst nightmare. You're the guy who once took a parachute onto a commercial flight after all. But then the woman across the aisle from you starts waving her Bible around, pointing a shaky finger right in your face. God is punishing us because you're on this plane. You turn your back on the true Christian God and now he wants you off this plane. Not as bad as I want to be off this plane, you think. But this time you say nothing. You try to stay strong. Remind yourself that being tested is part of your faith. But there are days, man, there are days, when you wonder if you're strong enough to survive the storm. You agree to a secret meeting with a high-powered politician in a hotel room in Chicago. You walk into a cloud of cigar smoke. You can barely make out the guy's ruddy face as you shake his hand. He cuts right to the chase. Every politician in this country wants the same thing, to see your ass in jail. No one with any power is going to lift a finger to help you. I'm aware of that. I feel it every day. Don't be a fool. I'm giving you the perfect deal. You tour around, do some appearances, boost the morale of the soldiers. You won't even have to pick up a weapon. All you have to do is sign on the dotted line. He hands you an application. It says special services at the top. This type of deal has been proposed to you once before in a worn down union hall in Ohio. But this is the first time you're seeing it all official in writing. If you take the deal, everyone will be happy. Your parents, your coaches, sports writers, diner waitresses, even the commissioners who banned you from playing your sport. It's your get out of jail free card. Just sign it. What do you say? The room falls silent and waits. It feels eerily familiar. And then you tell him what you told all those pro athletes in Cleveland six months ago. No. I will not participate in this war. The congressman's face turns red. You agreed before you came. I agreed to meet with you. But I didn't agree to be a part of this war. It goes against my religion, and I can't have people thinking I'm for it even a little. You turn and walk out the door. First autograph request you've ever turned down. You're waiting for the elevator when he comes rushing down the hall after you. Mark my words, son. The next time you hear from me, you'll either be in Vietnam or jail. Turns out, it's the latter. This episode of Imagined Life is brought to you by Ancestry. No other test brings family stories to life like Ancestry DNA. With over 350 region results, two times more than any other DNA test, Ancestry helps you learn a more complete story of you. And it certainly did for me. Now, when I decided to take an Ancestry DNA test, I thought I'd get a breakdown of my ethnicity. I did, and that was really cool. What I didn't expect was to see a breakdown of the migration patterns of my ancestors over time. I've got a centuries-long visual picture of where my ancestors came from. It's completely mind-blowing. I'm a new dad, and there's something about the process of becoming a parent that makes me want to get a better picture of my DNA story. Now I can share that with my daughter. It's truly one of the coolest things I've ever done. I recommend it to everyone. Want to take your own journey of discovery? Go to Ancestry.com slash imagine to get your kit today. For a limited time, it's on sale for $59. It's the perfect gift for the perfect price. Give the gift of discovery to yourself or share it with those you care about the most. That's Ancestry.com slash imagine. It's your fourth night in jail and you're wondering how anyone could survive more than a week in a place like this let alone five years. No, they didn't get you for draft evasion. That case is still pending. It's actually something much stupider, a minor traffic violation from years ago that you just totally blew off. Then last week, you get pulled over for speeding, and what do you know? There's a warrant out for your arrest. That's how you end up in the slammer. 
You've been assigned to deliver meals to the inmates on death row. As you enter their cell block, the smell of feces and urine is so bad you almost gag. You roll the cart up to the first cell. A prisoner looks up at you. His eyes go wide with recognition, and then he nearly falls to the ground laughing. Well, look who's serving the dinner tonight. <laughs> Glad to see you haven't lost your sense of humor. You gotta laugh, right? Otherwise, you'd never stop crying. They finally get you for draft dodging? Nah, an old traffic violation I never took care of. Ten days. So, this is like your practice run for the big one. Don't say that. You're gonna jinx me. That night, back in your cell, you lie awake on the lumpy bed. You think of your new wife and your baby girl who's less than a year old. She's just starting to toddle around the house. What'll happen to them if you're locked up for five years? How do you explain to your child who needs her daddy that you're going to jail for doing what you believe is right? It takes you hours to finally drift off. When you wake up the next morning, the guard tells you that a local judge has declared a Christmas amnesty for the non-violent offenders in the block. That include me? Barely. The judge had a hard time getting you off. Threats on his life, threats against his family. I don't know if you know this, but a lot of people out there hate you. Oh, I know it. Even though your career is over, you still have to pay the bills. So you start doing speaking engagements, most of them at colleges. Your dyslexia makes it a challenge at first, but you get better with every speech. You're even able to turn something painful from your past into a big laugh line. A young black man goes into a restaurant. A waitress says, I'm sorry, we don't serve Negroes. The black man says, that's fine. I don't eat Negroes. I just want a hamburger. <laughs> the young people that come to see you are against the war, too. And those numbers grow as the months go on. But to the government, you're still public enemy number one. When you get really hard up for cash, you agree to star in a Broadway musical. The show's called Buck White, and you play the title character. A fast-talking firebrand activist with a long beard, an afro wig, and a big 11 o'clock number called Mighty Whitey. The show closes after seven performances. That's showbiz. It's 1970, and as your case continues to meander its way through the courts, fear and doubt start to set in. Even if you were cleared to compete again tomorrow, you worry that you won't be able to get back to where you need to be physically. That fire in your belly that's always been there, the one that pushed you to be number one, to dream of that Cadillac, to lift people up, now it's barely a spark. On one particularly dreary day, you tell an interviewer you're retiring. I don't need no prestige at beating up nobody. I'm tired. If I retire now, I'll be the first black champion that got out that didn't get whipped. Fighters are just brutes that come to entertain the white people. Since you started at 12, boxing has been everything to you. And yet, even while you excelled at it, there's been something about it you resent. For years, you had a recurring nightmare. You're one of two slaves fighting barefisted on a plantation as your masters smoke fat cigars and wait for the bones to break, the blood to start flying. You always wake up in a cold sweat. So you resolved from the start to be a different kind of fighter. You do your own talking, defer to no one. You were going to be your own man, inside the ring and out. That's exactly what you did, and you did it spectacularly. But that's all over now. After all the years of fighting, you're just plain tired. It's a warm morning in June 1971. You pull up into a small market near your home in Chicago to buy orange juice. You're walking back to your car when the store's owner comes running after you. Hey, champ, I just heard on the radio. The Supreme Court said you're free, and it was a unanimous vote. 
you drop the juice and let out a whooping sound that can be heard for miles around. You've had some pretty sweet victories in your day, but this victory, after this long, long fight, will always be the sweetest. You go back inside and treat everyone in the store to orange juice. The store owner taps his cup to yours. So you're gonna fight again, right, champ? The retirement stuff is just talk, right? You just smile. It's a few hours before your big comeback fight at Madison Square Garden. A thin, soft-spoken old man is brought to your hotel room by one of your crew. He says his name is Judge Aaron. I saw Martin Luther King before he was murdered. He told me to come and see you. He said you wouldn't let people forget me. The man opens his shirt and shows you where the letters KKK have been carved into his skin. Then he undoes his pants and shows you the scars from where he'd been brutally castrated. You can't form words. Come on, Chef. We gotta get to the garden. Just a minute. I'll be right there. But you can't turn away from this man. You put your arm around him and he tells you about what happened to him. How he was attacked on the street by seven white men while walking to the store to buy bread. The last thing he says is, I just didn't want to be left lying in the road. Later that night, the man watches you fight from the front row. The image of his hopeful face looking up at you round after round until you finally vanquish your opponent will never leave you. Three years in exile have taken their toll on you physically, but you know now that your strength comes from all the Judge Aarons out there who believe in you. And you're not going to leave them lying in the road. It takes you three years to win back your title, but you do it. Beating George Foreman in the Rumble in the Jungle in Zaire. Knocking him out with a strong right in the eighth round. You defend the title four times, including the Thrilla in Manila over Joe Frazier, who was one of your only losses after coming out of exile. You get your jaw broken by Ken Norton in 73, but still win the fight 10 rounds later. You hold on to the crown until 1978, when up-and-comer Leon Spinks takes it from you. But you take it back from him that same year, making you the only three-time heavyweight champion of the world in history. But your legacy extends far, far beyond the ring. You travel the world, sharing the message of your faith and raising money for the causes that matter to you. From helping children who, like you, struggle with dyslexia, going to Iraq in 1990 and successfully securing the release of 50 American hostages held by Saddam Hussein. You even conquer your fear of flying. On one trip, a flight attendant notices you don't have your seatbelt on. Sorry, champ, but you're going to have to buckle up. Superman doesn't need a seatbelt. Superman doesn't need a plane. She's got you there. In 1984, you're diagnosed with Parkinson's syndrome. But you continue to spread goodwill in public ways, like the Parkinson's Center you open in Phoenix, Arizona, and less public ways, like when you drop everything to visit an old friend who's dying of cancer in the hospital. When the nurse tells you he needs to rest, you stay in the ward for hours, comforting other patients, sparring with orderlies, doing magic tricks for kids, lifting people up, making people feel better. There's a million stories like that about you out there. There's not a dry eye in the stadium or in the world. When Parkinson's tremors be damned, you light the torch at the 1996 Summer Olympics in Atlanta. It's a true full circle moment, not only for you as a returning gold medalist, but for a nation who had once turned their back on you, but now see you as a true American hero. 
In 2005, you received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President George W. Bush. This is a man who once fought more than 10 rounds with a fractured jaw. The real mystery, I guess, is how he stayed so pretty. <laughs> Probably had to do with his beautiful soul. After giving you the medal, Bush raises his fists playfully as if to spar, but you don't play along. Instead, you raise a finger to your head and twirl it as if to say, this dude is crazy. The crowd eats it up. Still your own man, even in the White House. You die in 2016, at the age of 74, of septic shock as a result of a respiratory infection. Your loved ones are nearby. You have a lot of loved ones. The funeral procession is led by 17 Cadillacs, naturally. The story of your life is one of great irony. You came to fame taunting people, then leaving them battered and bloody. Yet in the end, the words that come to mind when people think of you are peace, love, kindness, courage, faith. A reporter once asked you how you hope to be remembered. Your response was quintessentially you. I like for them to say he took a few cups of love. He took one tablespoon of patience, one teaspoon of generosity, one pint of kindness. He took one quart of laughter, one pinch of concern, and then he mixed willingness with happiness. He added lots of faith and he stirred it up well. Then he spread it over a span of a lifetime and he served it to each and every deserving person he met. You are not Cassius Clay Jr., though you used to be. You left that name and its roots in American slavery behind when you converted to Islam in 1964. That year, you took a new name. Translated from Arabic, it means worthy of all praises and most high. You float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. You're the one, the only, Muhammad Ali. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Imagined Life. If you did, please subscribe right now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Wondery.com, or wherever you're listening. If you're listening on your smartphone, tap or swipe over the cover art of this podcast where you'll find a link on the episode notes and some offers from our sponsors. Please support our show by supporting them. We use many sources for our stories. One source we found very helpful for this episode was Ali, A Life by Jonathan Eag. It has many stories and details about Ali's marriages, his conversion to Islam, and those unforgettable boxing matches. We also highly recommend Ali's autobiography, The Greatest, co-written by Richard Durham. If you like what you're hearing, we'd love you to give us a five-star rating and tell your friends to subscribe. Another way to support us is to answer a short survey at wandry.com survey. And a quick note about recreations you've been hearing. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said. Those scenes are dramatizations, but they're based on real historical research. I'm your host, Robbie Damon. Dennis Hensley wrote this episode. Sound design is by Jeff Schmidt. Audio assistance by Sergio Enriquez. The music by Breakmaster Cylinder. Imagine Life is executive produced by Stephanie Jens and Marsha Louie and created by Hernan Lopez for Wondry. For those of you great guessers out there, let's put your skills to good use. Don't just imagine what it would be like to listen to any book you want on your morning commute. Make it a reality with an Audible membership. You can win three months of free listening to books like The Diana Chronicles by Tina Brown or Elon Musk, Tesla, SpaceX, and the Quest for a Fantastic Future by Ashley Vance. So, how to win? After each Imagined Life episode, we'll give you a clue about next week's episode. Then, if you head over to wondery.com slash imaginedlife to submit your guess, you'll be entered for a chance to win your free three-month membership to Audible. This week's clue is, you were a cover girl before you were a big screen legend. Have an idea? Go to wondery.com slash imaginedlife to submit your guess, or find a link in the episode notes.